All right, so this is on page 630. This is an example of this biaxial idea in torsion. So uh, let's have a look. Um, so what we got here, um, we want to find, we're going to apply this torsion. So we got 5,000 pound feet, that's five kip. Now remember, kip is 1,000 pounds there. That's the torsion applied at the end. Um, and what we want to do is uh, find the maximum shear stress, tension, and compression in this shaft. You know, those are the things you want to know so you can design something. And then you want to put them on the sketches there, those elements. And then um, we'd also like to know what's happening in that 35 degree element as well. So let's see what we could do with that. Okay, and now what I did, I found the moment of inertia there for you, pi over two, R4, 402 inches to the four. So we're on page 630, that's where we're at. All right, so let's kind of walk through this and see what we could do. Um, so how about at, at the connection? So this thing's connected to a wall over there on the left is what's happening, All right? So right over there, they're connected to a wall. How about, um, how about putting the reaction there at the wall? What's that going to look like as far as the torsion goes? What's that? Yeah, right. Nothing, nothing too fancy. Man. It's just going to be the opposite of what's applied. So, yeah, why don't you, because uh, yeah, there's no, no addition or anything on this. There's no summing or anything that's to happen because there's just one applied torsion. So how about getting that sketched in at the wall? Okay. We're assuming this thing's in equilibrium. Now, even when things are spinning, you know, if, if you've got a shaft that's uh, driving things, if it's spinning at a constant rate, it also would be in equilibrium. So these ideas would apply, you know. Um, equilibrium, we often think of it as meaning no motion, but it really means no acceleration. So if it was spinning at a constant rate, you could do an equilibrium analysis. All right. So something like that, right? So 5,000 pound feet, which is what this is. A kip, again, is a thousand pounds. All right. All right, so we can start with that. Now, what's the maximum shear in there going to be then? What's the equation for maximum shear if you've got the torsion and the shaft properties? What, what are you going to do to get tau max? So, um, tau max is TR over I, right? This is the basic relationship. That's one of the fundamental things that we do there. Um, now, one thing we always got to be watching on this stuff are the units. Um, it seems to be, it seems to come up a lot when you're doing torsion. Um, so, what I'm seeing there is pound feet, all right? So, uh, watch it. And you know, we got feet, but shaft. Dimensions are typically in inches, so we're going to want to adjust that. I would tend not to take the cross section up to feet. I would tend to take the torsion down to inches. Okay, so we got 5,000 pound feet, and of course, we got 12 inches and a foot. So 60,000 pound inches, I think, is what you're after there. All right. So once you've got that, it's just a matter of plugging in. And uh, I'm getting 597 pounds per inch squared. When I do that. All right. So on the sketch there, I've got that conversion up on the top. And I also have the uh, reaction. Okay. So we all get to that, and that, that would be a plus or minus, okay? It, it's not shown in the formula, but remember that shear is positive and negative depending on what sides you're looking at, so, so we could uh, get that worked out, okay? So 60,000 pound inches, 4 inch radius because it's an 8 inch shaft, 
and we've got moment of inertia is 402. And you'll see the units on that come out to be pounds per inch squared, which is a stress, okay? So we're looking pretty good. And that, that would be a plus or minus, because that's how shear is. It's positive and negative. So, so we're doing all right with that. Okay. Now, what I've got there is a little bit of a square element there on the right. Why don't you sketch what the shear would look like on that element? So sketch that in. We did, went through that yesterday a bit when we did the, we were breaking things in here. So um, how about seeing if you can do that? Okay. So we just want to get from <clears throat> the sketch you see there of the torsion to the stresses acting on an element there. That, that's what we want to do here next. And you know, not, not a lot to it. You're just going to draw four arrows on that sketch on the square. Just get them going the proper direction. Look at how the shears go, and or excuse me, how the torsions act, and then mimic that on the element. So it's kind of like we got an element right there. Look at how those shears act, or excuse me, how the torsions act. Convert them into the same direction for the shears, and then meet in the corners. What you want to do. Okay. Y'all okay with that? So it might be helpful to look how those torsions act across the face of the shaft. You know, this one is curling up like that. The other one is curling down. So that will translate to shears down and up. You okay with that? And then the other two meet in the corners. So we're going to end up with a shear diagram like so. And that will be 597 pounds per inch squared. And then if you plug that into a biaxial formula, will your shear be positive or negative based on that diagram? When you start going into the biaxial formula, we got those modified ones for torsion because they're so much shorter. So 96 and 7 on those formulas, is tau XY going to be positive or negative when you plug it in? Positive. Yeah, positive, right, okay. So, right. All right, um, so there you go. So that looks something like that. All right, now what's the maximum? So that's, so that's the design value for the shaft. Again, I think it, it's kind of interesting. You know, you're, you're applying an awful lot of torsion there. Uh, however, the shaft is huge. I mean, it's an eight inch shaft. I don't know, it's, you know, be realistic or that's pretty, pretty large. Uh, but it's, look at how low the stress goes. Okay, it's not really that large of a stress for engineering kind of materials. It's, it is a huge shaft though. Um, okay, what are the maximum normal stresses on the shaft then? What's sigma max for that shaft? And uh, there's, it's on the formula sheet, you know, it's, it's all on there, it's on the back. Isn't that okay? It's uh, formula, what, 98? Okay. So they're, they're the same, right? So 598, we good? Or 597, we're good with that? Formula 98 on your formula sheet on the back. So the maximum shear and maximum normal stresses are the same when you've got torsion, okay? They're both TR over I. All right, now what angles do those maximum normals act at in a torsion shaft? 
It's kind of like a what angle if you give it a numerical value? Like what where do the planes start? How are they oriented? Yeah, 45. Yeah, 45. See, this is just some element that we're interested in. We're not even looking at that yet. We're, we're looking at the maximums. Yeah, it's 45 off the shear, right? That's in the biaxial stuff. So the way I, I kind of, you can do this, draw it up visually. So why don't you draw up which way they would act? So we're, and I think I, on your page there in the notes, I put a 45 degree element, like a diamond on, on page 630, okay? So on that, why don't you sketch in how they would act? And I've got kind of a visual way of doing this. You can also calculate it too. You know, you could do it either way. Um, so we've got shears like that. And we've got Shears going the other way, like that. And then I'm going to double them up and how I draw them just because uh, it'll help uh, with the visualization here. I think go like that, like that. I don't know. This is like that. All right, so I've drawn each here twice on my little sketch down there, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the midpoints of these lines, and that's going to get me the planes to draw the 45. So that's this is just a kind of a visual way of drawing these things up, okay? And then if you look at those stresses and treat them like vectors, now as I mentioned, they're not really vectors, but you know, for this purpose, we can kind of visualize them in that way. Um, what you want to do is combine two vectors that are next to each other, add them up, and get the resultant of them, and that will help you to draw the normal stress. So if I go with these two brown shear vectors, put them on the plane that they kind of relate to, because if I add them in a vector sense, they're going to do that. Okay. So up near the arrowhead, I'll just draw that net vector. You all good with that? So that normal stress on the 45-degree plane goes upright. Okay. And then I've got the two purples. Down below these ones and that one, add those together and they do that. And then if I add the pinks together, notice they're kind of pointing on this plane, pushing on it like that. And then the two greens I can do as well. So that's that's you know one way to do it. Now, like I say, when I'm doing a sketch, so so that's how those normal stresses act. Okay, you, you all okay with that little deal? That's a quick way to do it. Now you can calculate it too if you want, and it's not that hard to calculate either. If you don't, if you're not comfortable with what I'm doing there, you can run numbers on it and show which what the signs are. But you have to be kind of conscientious of how you plug stuff in and do all that. All right. And what I'm relating this to is what we were doing yesterday when we were looking at you know like this. This failed in tension because it was being pulled. We we figured out that the normal stresses there were at 45. Okay like that with the green vectors, the green arrows. And so that caused a tensile failure in that brittle material there, like so. And then we also then figured the compression would act the other direction as shown. So that crushed that in like so. Okay. So that's, that's what we're looking at is that kind of thing. All right. So we get plus and minus 597, positive for tension, negative for compression, and they act that way. Now, what I'm doing there, um, I'm showing you also down below how to do this and calculate it. All right. So you could run the sigma uh, max would be sigma 45, sigma x1, y1 for torsion is tau xy sine 2 theta. So what's going on there is I've got a positive shear. Tau xy is positive, okay, and that's right there, that one. It's tau xy, that's positive because it would rotate the element counterclockwise. If I plug positive 597 into that formula for 45 degrees, what I get is positive 597 for the normal stress. 
So what that means is that 40, on the 45 degree plane, which would be that one right there, that's because we're measuring from the vertical reference to that plane, 45 degrees, okay? I'm gonna show that there. The normal stress on that plane is positive. And if you plug 135 degrees into that formula, you'll get a negative, okay? So I'm just showing you two ways to do the same thing. Kind of a simple, quick visual way, uh, a more analytical way. Either way, you can get to it. So we all right with that stuff? Okay. All right, now the last thing I asked to do, I want to do on this one, which is an entirely separate problem, is I want to say, okay, what's the stress on that 35 degree element? Okay. So this is separate from what we just did. Okay, so to find them on the element, you just run the numbers. You've got the two formulas. Um, sigma x1 is tau xy sine 2 theta. Tau x1 y1 is tau xy cosine 2 theta. Just plug 35 in to those formulas and you'll get the stresses that act on that plane. So the normal stress is plus 561, the shear stress is plus 204. We could also, so we got the two normal stresses and then one of the shears, you only need one of the shears because they're uh, plus or minus you know, 204 around that element. The one at 35 degrees will be positive, this is the deal. All right. So I'm doing all right with that. So we get a sketch like that. So, so that's the biaxial stuff that you would do for a, a shaft that's in torsion. Got any questions on that bit? Good to go. All right. So that's a little bit on the biaxial stuff. So we did the max and the maximum stresses, which act at zero and forty-five degrees, and you know on elements oriented like that. And then we also, for whatever reason, wanted to see what the stresses were on that thirty-five degree element. So we kind of did two different problems there for, for that shaft. Now, let's look at the next thing, which is power transmission. Um, that's typically, at least in the mechanical engineering world, what you do with shafts. You, you run them out of a motor, the motor turns the shaft, you attach gears or a fan belt or something, and you drive things with, with the motors, okay? And so you're transmitting power with the shaft. There's a real typical arrangement for a pump. You got the motor, out of the motor comes the shaft, the shaft goes through a centrifugal pump. You've got an impeller on the shaft that's turned by the uh, shaft. So there's a thing called an impeller that is kind of this spiral shaped thing that throws the water out into the spiral shape, what's called the volute, which is the case of the pump. And that causes uh, pressure to build up in the pump and push the flow out the top. That's usually how these things work. Okay. And so the idea there is you're transmitting power from the motor to the pump. That's what you're doing with a shaft. Okay, now work is force times distance. If you've had dynamics, you might have seen that. If you've had physics, you might have seen that. Now you can combine the force and distance together and get a moment or a torque or a torsion and then multiply that by the angle and that's also work. So that's two ways to calculate work. So work is force over distance. The simplest uh, explanation I would have for work would be going back to a pump. 
What you do with a pump is you lift water up to some height. I mean, that's the function of a pump, is to move water and also usually to lift it somewhere. Um, so if you look at the weight of the water, which would be the force, and look at the distance you lift it, plus something called friction losses in the piping system, that would be the distance. Multiply them together, you get the work that's done. Okay. Now, if you want to uh, take a, a ton of gravel and move it up to the uh, top of the Sandy M Pass, that would be work. You would be lifting the gravel up to the top of the pass. All right. Now, you could do that with a wheelbarrow, right? And you could also do it with an F-250, all right? You could do it either way. Now, both would do the same amount of work if you moved a ton of gravel up to the top of the Sandy M Pass. However, the F-250 could do it a lot faster, I think, than you could, okay? Because the F-250 has more power. So power is the ability to do work quickly. So if you want to drain your swimming pool, you can put a little pump in there and spend a week at it, or you can put a big, powerful pump in there and do the same amount of work lifting the water out of the pool, but do it much, much faster, okay? So power is the ability to do work quickly, okay? So you can find power in, in different ways. Um, basically, it's work over uh, time, okay? So you can either go the force times the distance divided by the time or the torque, the torsion times the angle that has been turned by a shaft or something divided by the time. You can do it either way, okay? So when you look uh, at power then, You've got the torsion times the change in angle, okay, divided by the change in time. Well, you can combine the change in angle and the change in time, and that becomes omega, which is angular speed in radians per second. Okay, so you can take the torsion times the angular speed to get the power. All right. So we're good with that. Okay. Let's see. All right, now the units on power are a little funny, and especially in this country, they're, they're rather odd because we, we still use the old system that was developed in England, which England really doesn't use anymore. Um, it's called the imperial system because it's based on all these funny things that were, you know, hundreds of years ago. What's that? They're arbitrary. They, yeah, they're quite arbitrary, yeah. The length of a foot is, I think the length of some king's foot is 12 inches and a foot. <laughs> Um, a horsepower actually is the power of a horse. You know, it really is. It's it's a draft horse, and how much weight a draft horse could lift in amount of time when they were dewatering mines, when they were digging for coal in Britain. There's all these kind of odd units that are thrown into this, which make it kind of fun, but not real efficient. Um, you know, I, I tell your class this, but you know, we, we use the imperial system of units in this country quite a bit. We keep trying to get on the metric, you know, but but we never quite make it. Um, I had a friend who used to drop bridge plans for Oregon Department of Transportation. He had to make two sets. That one was in metric for all the engineers at ODOT. The other was in, in feet, in, feet in inches for the contractors because they didn't want to mess with metric. You know, they just wanted everything in feet and in inches because they're comfortable with it. You know. Um, now we we use this system. Um, to the, anyone know the other two countries in the world that still do? United States, Liberia and Burma. <laughs> so that's kind of it, okay? Yeah, that's it. Every, every other country's on the metric system. I think someday we're gonna go, but you know, we keep kind of trying, about every 10 years we make a run at it, and people just don't want to do it, so. You know, if you look at a car, you gotta have two sets of sockets, right, in these days, you know? Because you know, they're all a little different, okay? So, so, as I say, a horsepower actually is the power of a horse. That comes from uh, when the steam engines were, were marketed, a uh, fellow named James Watt um, actually rated what a horse could do. Um, all right, so this goes back, as I was just saying here, to, to Britain and dewatering coal mines back in the early Industrial Revolution. And James Watt, who didn't actually invent the steam engine but marketed it quite a bit, he actually figured up you know, that a horse, a typical draft horse that was used to dewater mines at that time, could lift, and I don't really know what the exact figures were, but it looks like they could lift a thousand pounds of water 33 feet in a minute. That, that's what James Watt came up with. So he called that a horsepower. Then he ranked his motor, his steam, his steam engine pumps, and said this is this many horsepower. And now you can start comparing the costs to you know to um, 
of the steam engine to take care of a horse, basically. So that's where that comes from. Okay. You probably marvel at my artistic skills, don't you? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I'm kind of more in the impressionistic school and how I, I like to do my art personally. But. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's over. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> anyway, so, so there you go. So if you have a nice, uh, say, a 1967 Corvette Stingray or something like that, you actually do have 327 horses under the hood. I mean, that, that's actually what that is. You know, that's, that's kind of how, that's work, how that works. Okay. Um, all right, so let's kind of have a look. Now, the problem with this, though, is, is now the other thing that complicates this a bit is we rank uh, our motors on horsepower. You know, you, you go to a store and you buy a so many horsepower motor uh, for your pump and all that. But when you plug it in, you start buying power in kilowatts. So we go into the metric system for the electric grid. So a watt is the metric unit of power. That's a newton meter per second. Kilowatts are more commonly used. A horsepower and a kilowatt are kind of in the same sort of ballpark. A horsepower is 746 watts or 0.746 kilowatts. Okay. And that stuff's um, on the formulas 100 and 101 and 102 on the back of the formula sheet. Okay. So the, one of the things that happens here is you have to do a lot of unit conversion when you're dealing with this stuff. Okay. So let's have a look at an example of this. Well, on 670 is where I'm at. So um, we've got an 8 centimeter shaft diameter. The shaft length is 1.2 meters. Uh, we've got G is 75 gigapascals. That's the shear modulus there. We can have 1.375 degrees of twist in the shaft. We can go up to 70 megapascals of what we call working shear stress. That's the maximum allowable shear stress. And the angular velocity of the shaft is 225 RPM. Now what an RPM is, is a revolution per minute. So that's 225 revolutions per minute. Okay. Revolution is one turn of a, uh, of a circle. Okay. What's that? That be. Thanks. So we're on 670. Yeah, what's happening to this online? I'm not projecting up here in class what, what I've got on my computer. Uh, which, uh, boy, okay, let's see what we got to do about this one. All right, just had some technical computer difficulties here in class. I think we got them straightened out. All right, so we've got 225 revolutions per minute. Okay, so we need to figure up a few things. So uh, as I've mentioned, doing this torsion stuff, I... Uh, I always do some background stuff, conversions, and I always figure up the moment of inertia and all that stuff right off the bat. So let's see. So let's get some of these conversions made and this moment of inertia kind of worked out. So the moment of inertia, what do we got? We got pi over 2. And then what goes in the parentheses? It's R, yeah. So 0.04, right, meters, okay. And then what power do we take that to? The four, yeah, okay. So that would be the moment of inertia. Now we also need to convert some things here too. Um, we already did one conversion, that's the radius is 0 0.04 meters. We're gonna need that, I think. Um, Let's see, what else do we got? We've got the shear stress, 70 megapascals. I mean, that's not a big deal, but uh, tau max would be 70 million, you know, newtons per meter squared. I guess that could have been better written as 70 times 10 to the sixth. Um, what else do we got going on here? We've got the angle phi, that's the twist angle, 1.375 degrees. What do we got to do with that? Yeah, you want radians, okay? Um, so the way to do that is there's two pi radians in a full circle, which means they're pi radians in 180 degrees.
Now, if you're ever on a test or something and you forget that, you don't need to ask me because it's on this formula sheet, lower right-hand corner, I've got that written out. So just so you know, it's, it's there if you need it. Um, and then what else? We got 225 radian, or revolutions per minute. You gotta be a little careful with that one because a revolution is not a native unit. You want radians is what you want. And then uh, how many radians in a revolution do you suppose? Yeah, 2 pi, because a revolution is one turn of a circle, which is 2 pi radians. Now, you can leave that in minutes. Quite often, I like to get it into seconds, so um, there's different ways you can do that. It may not be that important to do that. So that's all the, kind of the, the conversions you got to do and all the kind of this background stuff you got to do there. Um, so there you go. So I'm getting uh, the moment of inertia is 4.02 times 10 to the minus 6 meters to the 4, meters to the 4, and then uh, 0.024 radians for the 1.375 degrees, and then 225 revolutions per minute, 23.6 radians per second. Okay. So that's the stuff I do before I even start working through this, these torsional problems. Now what we want to do here is figure out uh, the maximum power that the shaft can deliver. Okay, so we're going to have to find power now. So we're going to want to end up by finding power. Now, before we do that, what we're going to need to do is to find omega, which I think we've already done. And then we're going to need to find the torsion. And then once you've done those two things, um, the power is the torsion times omega. Okay, so those are the things that we want to do. We've already found omega. Uh, we need to find the torsion, okay? Now the torsion, of course, we've got two formulas that involve that. We've got phi is TL over IG, and we've got uh, tau is TR over I, okay? So we're gonna have to back solve both of those for the torsion. We're gonna find two torsions, okay? and then pick the one that we want to use. And then from there, get to the power. That's going to be the strategy on this one. Okay. So we're doing all right with that. Okay, so I just back solve them both. Those formulas, I just rearrange them and solve them for torsion. So the torsion is the I G over L and the torsion is tau max I over R. I just run both numbers, plug the stuff in. I've got everything figured out now. I've got V is 0.024 radians. I got I. I've got G is given. The length is given there. It's 1.2 meters. And then I've got uh, the torsion is tau max. I've got that given. 70 times 10 to the 6. I got I and the radius. And I run them both. Okay, and I come up with two torsions, of course, because these two things are unrelated. Kind of that restraints, you know, it's not like the angular restraint, which is 0.024 radians, is directly related to the shear restraint, which is 70 times 10 to the 6. Those are kind of independent values. So that's why I get two different answers. And then what I'm going to need to do is to pick one to use to find the maximum power the shaft can output. So what would that be, do you suppose? When you're Doing this type of analysis, you want to go with the smallest of the two, right? Because if you go over the 6,032, what's going to happen is you're going to have too much twist in the shaft. Okay? You can't go up to the 7,037 because it'll give you too much twist. That's the deal. Okay. All right. So the 6,032 governs. Now, once we've got that, we multiply it by the angular speed, and then we might have to do some conversions here. It kind of depends. I notice this one is in metric units, so we may not need to get into horsepower. I guess I guess we did because we, okay. So we got the six thousand thirty-two. We all good with that? We do okay. All right. And then we just uh, multiply that by the angular speed, and then do whatever conversions are needed to get to where we need to go. So I've got six thousand. 32 times 23.6, uh, 
I get 142,000. Um, that's Newton meter per second, which is a watt. So that's 142 kilowatts. But if you want to buy a motor in this country, generally speaking, you, you buy them based on horsepower. So that'd be 190 horse for this, which is a lot of horsepower, okay, for a motor. Um, probably would buy a 200 horsepower motor because they, you know, they don't, they make them in certain increments, of course. Okay. All right. So that would be the output of this thing. Now, uh, we do a lot with energy efficiency. Of course, we're not doing a whole lot with it right now because um, basically a lot of that has to do with fracking, you know, and, and that technology that really opened up a lot of energy in this country, which is, you'll notice gasoline prices are quite low. That's all related. If you use, if you have natural gas, you can replace petroleum products for a lot of uses, not all uses, but a lot, and that'll, you know, it lowers the demand on petroleum, so that drops the petroleum prices too. So that's why we have such low energy um, costs right now, primarily in this country. Um, so, um, but, you know, when energy costs are higher and we have concerns about that, we, we look at efficiency, which is often a factor of cost. So if we say um, power costs, I don't, know, I don't know what a kilowatt hour is right now. Did I? I didn't plug a number into that either. So let's say 12 cents. I don't know. It used to be a little bit below 12, but let's say it's 12 cents. We would run this set of numbers. So that'd be 12 cents is 0.12 dollars. And what you could come up with then, if you're going to run this system eight hours a day, 30 day month, you could see what the cost of that will be. All right, and that's an important number if you're looking at, at replacement and things like that. You could look at uh, higher efficiency motors and things like that. So what I have here is the motor efficiency is 85%. Okay, so if I take that 142 kilowatts, I would divide it by 0.85. That would be the power input into the motor because I know I'm only getting 85% of that out. So I take the output of the motor, divide it by the efficiency, I get the input, what comes into it. Okay. You all know, with me there? Because I know I'm going to take 85% of the input to get the required output, which is 142. So I can back into what the input has to be. That would be 8 hours a day, 30 days a month, 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Okay, so if I multiply that by 8 times 30 times 0.12, I'm getting 4811, I think. Okay. Which, um, you know, that can start adding up. So, what you might start doing then, if you could get a motor that's more efficient, 90%, you could start seeing how much money you would save a month and then see how long it would pay off, how long it would cost, how long it would take to pay off the new motor. You know, you could do that. That's kind of the basis of analysis that we often do to see how cost effective some of these things are. You know, I, I remember uh, a long time ago, I bought a furnace, a gas furnace for a house that I owned and um, you know, I was talking to the uh, salesperson when I was buying the furnace and he said, uh, you know, you could get a high efficiency furnace, but it's probably not worth it because you spend so much more for it. You just don't get, it doesn't pay itself off. That's what he told me. What was it like? It's gas. That was a long time ago, too. Oh, okay. long time. I, ago. I know now they have the 90 percent Oh, for, for gas or yeah, so they recycle the oh, okay. They recycle the exhaust back in somehow. Yeah, and okay. But they also lower the speed of our stuff. They also are cars can't lower the speed. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, efficiency comes with a couple. First, the upfront cost. It's more fit, more yeah. expensive to make it. The other cost, I think, that I would be considering on that, too, is the maintenance cost. Because when you start doing things like that, the, the machines get more complex and they're harder to keep Maybe, running just right. Yeah, because these machines, they had to stop plumbing with them. Yeah. The, uh, they have to be condensed. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. And so I had to get rid of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah okay. Got it. Okay. So. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be seeing, you know, more of this in the next couple of years. You know, I think energy, um, there's so much going on. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be seeing, you know, more of this. You know, I think energy, um, you know, it's an issue and it's something I think we do need to be more efficient in our use of it so you'll see more you know, this type of work I'm sure. There's work that's done with heat pumps like using 
heat pumps for uh, water heating and things like that, and using the ground too as a yeah those types of things. So you know, there's lots of always lots of things going on, kind of stuff for engineers to figure out. Okay. All right, why don't we look at one other here? Um, the next one, 680. So we've got a solid circular shaft. We, we want to be solved. We're going to rotate it at just 90 RPM and transfer 150 horsepower. We can go up to 8,000 PSI. Um, we've got the shear modulus and the length and the twist angle. Let's figure out, let's design the shaft. What kind of shaft diameter can we get away with? So we want the smallest shaft diameter we can get away with that will do these things, okay? So this is a bit of a design problem. So I want to do, I've already done some of the conversions. We want to do a couple others though. We want to get that feet of length into inches and we want to get um, the angle into radians. I've got the rotational speed in radians per second, that's good. And I figured out, the, I converted the 150 horsepower into 82,500 foot-pounds per second. So, again, on this torsional stuff, as a first step, I often think about conversions. That's often what I'm looking at doing. Now here I want to come up with a shaft diameter, and that's going to get a little bit involved. Um, so I'm going to have to think that through a little bit. Okay? Because I've got these uh, equations and the shaft diameter is kind of embedded in them, you might say. So I have to figure out how to, how to work that out. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is find the torsion. I've got the power, and I know that's the torsion times omega. I've got omega. So I can take the power that I found, the 82,500, and divide it by the angular speed. And I can get 8754 foot-pounds, which would be the torsion, but I know I probably want that in inch-pounds because I've got all my shafts and things I designed in inches. So I'll get that into 105,000 uh, inch-pounds, basically. Okay. So I did the conversions first, and then I just have that little relationship for power, that power is torsion times omega. So I can solve for the torsion. It's the power over omega. Just watch your units, you know, just be sure you're getting out what you want. I think probably I want pound inches out of that, okay? So I'm getting that. So that's my torsion. Now I've got two constraints again. What I've got for constraints is the twist angle, which I found is 0.045 radians, and I also have the allowable shear stress which is 8,000 PSI. So I'm going to work with those two numbers now because those are the things that my equations do. I've got the phi is TL over IG and the shear is TR over I. So I'm going to work with those to try and figure out the size of the shaft. Now that's going to get a little bit embedded here in what I'm doing. So I'm going to have to take that tau max formula, which is TR over I, and I'm gonna to have to rearrange it and solve it for the size of the shaft, which is the radius, which at first glance might look pretty easy to do because tau max is TR over I, but you gotta remember that I has the radius in it also. So what I'm doing there is just kind of working through that equation step by step to solve it for the radius, but I have to realize that the radius is embedded in the I term also. So TR over I is TR over pi over two R four, which is two TR, over pi r4, which is 2t over pi r3. So tau max is 2t over pi r3. That means r3 is 2t over pi tau max. So r is the third root of 2t pi tau max. Okay? So that took a little deriving there, but that's basically how you size a shaft if you know the torsion and the allowable shear stress. You could plug those in and size the shaft. And that involves a few things, you know, you have to uh, basically write out that I term as pi over 2R4 and then include that R into your formula and solve that out. That, that's what's going on there. So I'm just showing all the steps on getting that derived. Okay? And that's an R right there. That, there we go. It's a little bit better R. Okay. No, maybe not. Too long. There we go. Okay. 
okay? So I'll just plug into that and I can find out what the radius is, okay? So I'm gonna take the third root of 2t over pi tau max and I'm gonna get 2.03 inches, okay? Now, the way I do a third root on my calculator is there's a Y to the X button. Some of them got an X to the Y button, and then one third, and then equal or enter or whatever you hit, just so you know, okay? Because I'll have you do some of this stuff, so um, there's probably a button on there somewhere like that. And, and you invert the number. It's one, to take a third root, you take it to the one third power is what you do, okay? So that's, that's just how you do that on your calculator. Okay, when I do that, I get to 2.03 inches. So that's my size, okay? okay. Good to go on that, all right. And then um, I'm gonna do that again for the angular formula. So again, I just have to use the fact that IP is pi over two R4. So phi is TL over IG which is T, TL over IG, excuse me, TL over IG, which is TL over pi over 2 R4G, which is 2TL over pi R4G. So R4 is 2TL over pi phi G. So R is the fourth root of 2TL over pi phi G. So I'll solve it out again. And so what I have now is I just in the last problem, I've got these two independent parameters. I got the shear at 8,000 PSI and I got the angle that came out to be uh, whatever that was, um, 0.045 radians. And I got two different answers. So when you design stuff, which, which one are we gonna go with? Yeah, go with the bigger of the two when you design stuff. Now, when I see that number, it's 2.03, was it? 2.043, 2.03. Um, so this is R phi, R tau was 2.03. Now, if I'm gonna build 10,000 of these things, I ain't gonna be real happy to see 2.03 because you you're not gonna custom make a shaft 2.03 with a 4.06 diameter shaft, okay? You're gonna buy a shaft from somebody. And my guess is they got four inch shafts but I'm pretty sure they're not going to have 4.06 inch shafts. And you probably have to go up to four and a half or something like that. Maybe it's four and a quarter. I don't really know how that goes. But, but okay, so if I see that and I'm working, I'm going to start looking at some of my assumptions that went into that. And I'm going to see if I can safely shave the 0.03 off of that and use a two inch shaft. If I'm going to build 10,000 of those, that cost might start to add up. So that, that might be what I do, okay? And sometimes I mentioned, you know, what you lose sleep over when you're working, and that's one of the little decisions you got to make sometimes. And you got to think about it because, you know, I'm a civil engineer. To do any civil work, you got to be a uh, design work anyway. You got to be registered engineer. And when you're a registered engineer, you stamp your drawings, you put your name right on there. So, you know, when you start making those kind of decisions. You got to think about it a little bit. Just be sure that you're doing the right thing. That's it. Right. Uh, so let's get you a couple of these to do for uh, Wednesday. Maybe remember, we don't have school Monday, right? So how about, I'll give you four of these, 281 and 2. And then um, this is 302 and 303, I think. Yeah. 302 and 303. And these will be due Wednesday. No school Monday. Uh, 19th, I think. I'm pretty sure. Okay.